Um, in the case of conscious thought, which Fred focused on, the claim will be something like in consciously thinking that being unconsciously thinking, um, that there's going to be a third world war. Well, one's thinking about, one's cognitively aware, if you like, of you know, third world war and such related things, but one's not consciously aware of thinking about it. That's one doesn't have that distinctive kind of experiential awareness of the thought itself. And again, perhaps one never has that kind of um, conscious awareness of the thought itself. So that's a strong transparency thesis. It's really a very strong thesis. I think it goes a long way beyond what you get from, uh, from Moore and from Evans. Um, one might want to distinguish it from a bunch of weaker transparency thesis. I mean, there's this thesis just that it's, it's, very, it's hard or difficult to attend to, uh, to mental states. We saw that in, uh, in Moore, and uh, Amy Kind has written a nice paper where she um, really focuses on that one as being the, uh, that sort of thesis as being the more plausible sort of transparency thesis. There's also the, uh, the thought from Evans about the kind of priority of certain procedures um, informing knowledge of one's mental states. So, Evans says, one attends to mental states by attending to their contents, roughly. Well, the, the method I go to, I go through in order to form beliefs about what, I, about what I believe is the same as the method I go to just in figuring out what to believe. I just think about the state of the world and the Third World War. Something also, something similar, as I said before, applies in experience. It looks like uh, in coming to know, maybe even coming to be aware of having an experience of green, of seeing something green, what do I do? Well, I attend to the green thing. That's something about the priority of certain forms of cognitive act or certain forms of attention and coming to self-knowledge. Again, that's an interesting thesis. It doesn't give you anything like the strong thesis. So there's another thesis, which is the thought that, you know, I alluded to by Jesse, <laughs> that, uh, that things like colors and shapes and, uh, you know, and pictures and sounds and so on as kinds of mental paint, they're like the components of experience, the, uh, the stuff you kind of you color in, the, the meat that you put together to make up an experience. If Barclay talked about color as the, the matter of vision, the stuff that you assemble. And you know, maybe it is kind of plausible that seeing and experiencing and thinking isn't, the experience of those things isn't mental paint, doesn't correspond to elements of mental paint in the same way that uh, colors and shapes and so on do. But in my own view, one ought to be very suspicious of the claim that every element of experience is you know, as vivid um, and concrete as these, you know, these mental paint-like like notions. So anyways, the strong transparency thesis is something, I think you've got to be qualified, you may have to qualify this to deal with cases like you know, beliefs about other beliefs and so on, but I think it's not, uh, one doesn't need to worry too much about the exact details for present purposes. So focusing on the strong transparency thesis, why accept the strong transparency thesis? I mean, my own view is I find the strong transparency thesis quite implausible, both on phenomenological grounds and on general philosophical grounds. At least upon seeing a thesis like this, the thesis is that you know, one doesn't have this kind of experiential awareness of one's mental states. Um, why should we accept that? Well, I mean, one reason you sometimes see comes from certain theoretical commitments, out of a kind of prior commitment a strong representationalism about experience. Many philosophers these days think that to have an experience just is to have a state with a certain kind of content that represents certain things in the world. Having an experience as of a, uh, uh, a blue bowl, it's a certain kind of visual experience, is just to have a state that represents a blue bowl out there in the world. I'm not unsympathetic with that view, kind of view myself. You might then go on to say, okay, so access to experience is just access to that kind of content. Freud articulated the version of that kind of, a, that kind of principle. Our point of contact with what we're thinking is always in virtue of its content. Now, I think that, I mean, Freud wasn't deriving this from a strong representationalism. One way to, you can see, I think some people have tried to derive this from a strong representationalism. My own view is that just doesn't follow, even if you accept a strong representationalism. Just, you know, to have an experience, just to have I can't think. So experiential state, the state of seeing a blue ball, is just the state of, of having a certain content. What's going to fall from that is that access to being in that mental state will be a matter of access to having that content. Um, it's not going to follow, though, that uh, it's just going to be access to the content itself. Access to the experience will involve access to stand, 
if to, to have the experience is to stand in a certain relation to that content, then access to the fact that one's having the experience is going to be access to, to standing in a certain relation to that content. That, that will involve something like the act or the attitude in, uh, in Fred's term. So this, I think, is a non sequitur. Fred gave a uh, developmental um, argument, appealing to the, the, uh, the thoughts of a, of a three-year-old. Roughly a three-year-old can think P, can think there's something in the box, without being able or even in a position to think that they think P. So OK, it looks like uh, in thought, you don't have awareness of thought. Um, that was the conclusion that Fred drew. But it's something we've learned from, uh, from Fred's own work in the, uh, in the past, that awareness of X in the relevant experiential sense doesn't always require the ability to think about X. So uh, that's addressing 1969 on uh, seeing and knowing. You could be aware of the cufflinks in, uh, in experience without knowing that they're cufflinks, without even being in a position to know that they're cufflinks. You might not have the concept of cufflinks. You may be in a position to later on form the concept, to later on form the concept of cufflinks and to come to know that. But uh, awareness of, it, of, of something doesn't require the ability to think about it. So, um, Likewise, in this case, you might say, um, perhaps when one's thinking that the, one could be in a state of awareness, the three-year-old, for example, could actually be, for all we've said, aware of her thinking that P, without being in a position to think that she thinks that P. Her relation to her thought may be like the person who's seeing relation to the cufflink. It's a form of pre-conceptual, pre-doxastic awareness. At the very least, this, this inference pattern, I think, is from, you know, you can't think about it, therefore you're not aware of it. It does run into the kind of wiring that Fred's raised in the past. So I think, and on, uh, on discussion with Fred after his talk and since then, uh, you know, I think that really the central thing that's doing the work for him and for many others is really a phenomenological argument. You know, upon examining my experience, I find awareness of, you know, I find agreement and the blueness. Upon thinking, in my phenomenology, I find the content. The Third World War. Belief that, when I believe that I'm now in California, in my experience, I find California. But you don't find awareness of mental states in one's experience. You don't find the, uh, the thinking as an object of awareness. You don't find the uh, seeing as an object of awareness. This is just held to be something that's phenomenologically implausible. Now, I don't know. Phenomenological arguments are notoriously difficult and, uh, and problematic. Eric has, uh, has done a lot, of, uh, a lot of fine work in uh, bringing out the various respects in which you know, philosophers, scientists, ordinary people get into intractable arguments over these things. And there may well be such a phenomenological dispute around here that's going to be hard to settle. Still, it does look like there are some prima facie points one can make here. I mean, at least upon introspection, once one engages in certain distinctive forms of introspection, the experience of, take a proposition P, like uh, there's a red dot in front of me. I mean, on the face of it, the experience of thinking that there's a red dot or a green piece of paper in front of me differs from the experience of seeing that there's a red dot in front of me. I can close my eyes to think there's a red dot in front of me. I can look at it, see there's a red dot in front of me. I can form the intense desire that there be a red dot in front of me. Oh, red dot, please appear in front of me. Um, that's a different kind of experience. Again, what it's like to have these experiences is different. What would like to hope that there's a red dot in front of me, to fear that there's a red dot in front of me. Upon introspection, at least, these seem to be very different states. That's at least, I think, prima facie evidence that one's relation to the content P, there's a red dot in front of me, makes a difference to one's phenomenology, makes a difference to what it's like to be one. Now, maybe this isn't conclusive. Evidence. Phenomenology is hard. Some people may think that believing or wanting, thinking or wanting makes no, uh, makes no difference at all to phenomenology. I'm not saying it's a, that's an outrageous position. But I think this prima facie point is at least enough to suggest that the denial of this claim is not a datum, is not a phenomenological datum. And, and it looks like at certain points, proponents of strong transparency are taking the denial of these phenomenological claims as a datum. Now, and especially given the, uh, the seriousness and the implausibility, I think, of the positions you get to if you deny. I mean, from taking this denial, the strong transparency claim as a datum, I think we ought to at least be suspicious of 
the denial 